involved with all the uh, security releases for Drupal 6. And through the years, um, I got to see all the common problems in the, uh, that we deal with in the Drupal security team. Uh, so I hope I can um, help you in avoiding those. And to be able to tailor this session for your needs, I hope to uh, see how many managers there are in the community, or in the audience, how many of you think you are managers? Quite a few, okay. How many of you think you are site builders? Very good, that's, that's the track we are on. Uh, how many of you think you are themers, building themes for Drupal? That's not much, that's kind of interesting. Uh, how many of you are hardcore developers, or not de so hardcore about developers? Okay, that's very good. So I hope to have uh, content for all of you, and if the only thing that you gather from this session is to go and buy this book, then my mission is accomplished. Um, it's not written by myself, so it's not a shameless plug on my own. Uh, it's written by Greg Nadison. It's called Cracking Drupal, a Drop in a Bucket. And it's a very good book for learning about Drupal uh, security. It's for Drupal 6, it's not for Drupal 7 yet. As far as I've heard, it's being updated for Drupal 7. It's very good to learn the different problems, and especially, if nothing else, you read, I think, chapter eight, where it talks about finding Drupal sites to hack into, how you hack into Drupal sites, uh, different techniques, and then how you uh, prevent those. It's very insightful, and you'll learn a lot about how, how, how you can look as a, as a third, uh, third party on your websites and see, see it from a distance and find these problems. Uh, of course, uh, you think you're probably affected and you need to know about this, but a lot of people ask this, am I really affected? I'm like, I'm running a small block here or a small e-commerce shop and nobody's interested really in the data that I have here. And the answer to this one actually is that people look for all kinds of data on the internet. If they can hack into your site and you're a minuscule small site somewhere on the internet, they might still be able to get your, us get your user account database and be able to use the same user accounts on Facebook or on Twitter or somewhere else where it's more valuable or hack into someone's uh, Apple ID or Amazon.com account. Because many people use the use same uh, credentials on all kinds of websites. So even if your site is just a small a bit in the ocean somewhere, you can easily have valuable data for people to get, uh, even if it's just data on other people. And the other uh, reason that you uh, might be concerned is that with very simple holes, your administrator user can be taken over, and that means anything can be done with your website. And that's pretty serious. And I will show a few ways to do that on a Drupal site if it's not, uh, if it's not operated properly. Now, I chose to use a framework for this session that's based on the Open Web Application Security Project Top 10 Security, uh, Top 10 uh, um, uh, Risk List, right? So they looked at all the risks that websites are uh, facing on the internet and put up a top 10 list of what are the most important ones and what we should uh, take into account first and foremost. And I'm trying to uh, put the Drupal security practices into this framework so you have a, um, have a common framework to compare the Drupal solutions to and uh, kind of relate to what the industry thinks about these problems. I did not put all the things in order because I think the, the most important for us here to start off is number six, which is uh, security misconfiguration because it's very easy to go wrong um, in that area. Anybody heard of the uh, WordPress.com attack that happened in mid-April? Anybody? No? It's kind of interesting. It was a big issue. And I'm not picking on WordPress.com because it's our competitor in WordPress. No. Uh, this could just as easily happen to any Drupal site. It's not WordPress specific. The, the problem, the, 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 uh, the reason that I, um, I come with this is because it was a huge scale problem with, I think, 20 million websites that are hosted there. So um, what they've experienced is that they've had a perfectly nicely set up WordPress instance, and the attackers went in below WordPress on lower levels and gained root access on the servers, 
and they and they uh, got access to the source code of all the custom source code that's not open from WordPress.com, and some of the customer data that was there, and took that and did something with it. We don't know. We don't know what. It, we didn't get a lot of information on what actually happened there. What we got is that it was an attack of the system under WordPress. It was attack outside of uh, WordPress's control. And when you are thinking about Drupal security, it's very important that whatever you do with Drupal, Drupal lives in a huge system. So there's a lot of things running around Drupal that you have on your server, and you need to take care about that uh, first. Um, it, matters, uh, it, it matters a lot what kind of tools you use to maintain and deploy your website. I would say you should avoid FTP at all costs. Anything that sends unencrypted information over the wire, you should avoid. We'll get, it, get uh, to the fact later that all, all of you who have your open laptops might be sharing some valuable information about um, your account, but we'll see that. Um, check your client tool, whatever client tool you use, where it stores the data. If you search on Google for, um, for um, Total Commander or Windows Commander, FTP uh, password tool, then you'll find tools that you can just upload a total commander password file and it will um, unencrypt, uh, uh, decrypt it for you and you will have access to all the passwords that are stored in that file. And you can just upload your password file online. So anybody who, who, ha who has access to your machine like a virus uh, cracking in can get all your credentials to all the sites that you're using with, uh, with total commander. Think about who do you share your server with. If you're running on a shared, uh, shared hosting service, who else is uh, putting software on that service? Who else is putting all kinds of other tools on that service? And think about what they have on there. Are you confident in who else you're sharing servers with? Uh, at one time, I've had my, my personal website at a, at a, um, um, at a shared hosting provider, and, and turned out I was uh, running with some hardline leftist parties, like political parties. I was running on the same server, and I was kind of concerned that if somebody would like to attack them, what happens to my data? So think about that. If you're running other apps, that could be pretty, uh, pretty problematic. There's uh, forum software out there, like PHP BB2, that's historically very vulnerable to security issues. So even if you perfectly secure a Drupal website, everything's perfect on your Drupal website, there can be other tools that can, can be used to hack into your uh, web presents. Um, of course, uh, you can go even lower, the, the uh, OS layer, PHP, your SQL server, your keys to the server room, whatever. But when it comes to securing Drupal, there's some very basic configuration things that you should think about. Uh, Drupal tries to help you pick a good admin password. Drupal 6 doesn't do a very good job in that. It like throws big red and yellow error messages every time you don't type the ideal password in the world. Uh, so admin is not a best password. Uh, keep in mind the suggestions provided by Drupal, but there's maybe better, better um, suggestions around the internet on picking strong passwords. Look at all the admin permissions on the site. If you give any of those out to anybody, your site can be easily taken over. If you have administer users or administer permissions, um, permission given out to somebody, they can edit other users um, and grant them new permissions, and then those users can take over your website. So a lot of these permissions are uh, opening up your system very wide to anybody who, um, who wants to uh, crack your that or your service. So think very wisely about who you trust those. Administer filters is a permission that looks very, uh, very um, uh, safe. It's like, yeah, it's filters getting in data and then putting out HTML. And we'll see an example soon that if you uh, pick this permission for some user, they can also take over your whole site. Because it's content coming in your service and administer filters about what kind of security process is put on that content uh, to be uh, printed to the user, and that, um, that control can let people take over your website as well. Um, there's, uh, so the security team is hard at work in putting out fixes for all the modules that are on Drupal.org. There's thousands of modules. 
and there's a lot of work in, in putting that out. So if you want to uh, maintain, or not if you want to, but you should maintain your Drupal website to be up to date with all the security updates. And Drupal uh, has the built-in update module for that, which you can enable, and it can alert you by email about latest updates to your modules. So it's very easy to do. I would suggest you do that. Um, and the other thing to note here is that for those, for those new versions that are coming out, we have a standard to do those on Wednesdays. The reason for that is uh, so we have a predictable schedule for all the important security updates that you need to make to your website. We put those out on Wednesdays. So if there's no security releases for your models on Wednesdays, you can go on holiday on the Thursday and come back on a Tuesday. Uh, we let you go to the beach and, and sip mojitos. Uh, but on Wednesdays, uh, any module can have a security release. Also, it lets you have some QA time with your website until you need to leave for the weekend, of course. So we have a process in place for informing you and we have a process in place for making the releases predictable. Um, further on securing the Drupal configuration itself, I would say you should avoid any kind of PHP input. Drupal has this PHP module. You should forget about it. It's not there. Never enable it. If you want to um, hide it without hacking Drupal core, you can use the paranoia module that hide, hides the PHP module among other very good things and never allows you to enable it. It also hides itself so people cannot uh, disable paranoia module. It also does all kinds of other things to improve security on your website. So I think it's a very wor worthy module too. Uh, to look into using. As I've said, you should watch your input formats. Uh, one of the uh, great things, or one of the interesting things about input formats is that they come with standard help text. So when you enable some input formats, they come with standard text like this. Uh, this field allows you to enter any kind of HTML input, or these tags are allowed, and it lists all the tags. Now, this, these very standard tags can be Googled, and we can search for sites that are vulnerable to certain um, uh, injections of data. So we can look for the standard tags and uh, find websites that we can enter malicious data into and, and hack into. So if you, if you enable uh, full HTML input, for example, for anonymous users, then you can easily run into um, problems where people Google your site and then enter data and they already hacked your property. There's the security review module, which runs, runs through these things that I've said, most of these things that I've said, and many more that help you um, have a good check of whether your site's configured securely or not. But these are some of the uh, rules that you should follow. Now, to go back to the first, uh, first point in the uh, OWASP list, uh, it's about injection. There's many kinds of injections in in the web security, I'll talk primarily about um, SQL injection here and hopefully get you a comfortable feel of how Drupal tries to protect you uh, from that. Uh, SQL injection is very simple. You have, you have your web address and there's some data coming in there. And if somebody puts in a, a number there, it means that it updates your value to that number. But if somebody puts in malicious data there, like uh, they end the quote and then they do something to update the user password in that table or they do a select on another table or do an update on another table that could be pretty dangerous. So what we do in Drupal is we protect that or we force that kind of data to be of certain type and that type in case of Drupal 7 is introspective from the database schema. So we look at the database schema and we realize that that value should be a number and we convert that value to a number at that place. And we ensure that there is no um, unintended data to go in there. If you need to have your dynamic table names either in your modules or in your themes to be protected in this way, look at the DB escape table function. So the injection um, problem that I, I just explained is basically about data coming in right from the web request and right into, in this case, an SQL query and running through there. But the same can happen to any kind of data that comes from another database table or an XML file or an RSS feed. 
So just don't assume that the data is coming always from the URL. The important part is to always treat the data that's coming from somewhere that you don't trust as potentially um, an attack. And uh, to, at the place where you use the data, ensure that you use the right format. Now, as I've said, I have a few code examples in my session. And one of the points that the, um, that the um, Drupal security book makes is that most of the vulnerabilities on Drupal sites are in themes, okay? So people download modules and those modules are pretty well uh, controlled and we put out security releases for those modules, but themes are custom made for your Drupal websites. And most of the problems come, come from themes. So even if you, even if you think you, you are just building themes, it might be the most dangerous uh, thing to do for a site's security. A much more interesting is number two is cross-site scripting, uh, abbreviated XSS, because CSS was already taken. Um, it's a very similar problem, but this time, we are not injecting data to an SQL query, we are injecting data to the HTML output. Uh, that data can come from the query, can come from the request, the URL, either a form or a query string or somewhere else. And we are just printing it out. Or it can come from data we stored previously, like the node title. Drupal, store, Drupal usually, usually stores data without any filtering on it. So we store the data, and when you use the data in your theme, in your module, in your view, in your whatever, you're responsible for sanitizing that data and making it secure, okay? So the node title can contain any kind of data that breaks your site or makes your site vulnerable. If you just put the node title in the output, print out the node title as is in here in the theme, then it's gonna be vulnerable. So we made a lot of things accessible in themes and in preprocessed functions that are already secured, like the dollar title variable, which is already made secure, but if you're going deep in structures like the node title uh, property, that is insecure. Giving full HTML access or uh, trusting people to enter unsafe tags is a similar problem. And um, cross-site scripting might not look like a big, pro big problem at first, it's just injecting stuff to your web page. How can that be serious? Um, White Hat Security put out a research paper, I think that was uh, this March, yes, and they estimated the, um, the likelihood of cross-site scripting on any website as 64%. So that your website has a cross-site scripting issue, you have 64% chance, okay? So your, your website likely has a cross-site scripting problem. Now, if your website has a cross-site scripting problem like printing out the note title or uh, you're uh, granting full HTML access to people who cannot be trusted or those people can uh, enter unsafe HTML tags or you grant uh, administer user's permission or administer filter's permission to people who, don't, who shouldn't have that, then those people can do this to your site. So this is a code sample that's, that was posted by Heine Dielstra, the Drupal security team lead, uh, way back. And this exact code sample runs on Drupal 5, but the same uh, code, same principles can be brought forward to Drupal 6, it's, it's more code, but the same principles run on Drupal 6. And a bit more work is required for Drupal 7, but, but a cross-site scripting issue on any Drupal 7 site is enough to achieve the same effect. So what happens here? is that uh, we put in a little, just a little bit of JavaScript. This is not much, right? This is a tiny code snippet. And what we do is uh, we get the user slash one slash edit page, which has the edit page for user number one. Uh, and when that actually happens, we run this function. Uh, if it's a successful request, then we look at the form token that ensures for Drupal that we loaded the form. We remember that form token in the token variable and we, in the payload, we put in that we are the user edit form. We put in the token, and we put in a password of our choosing, and then we submit the form with a post request. That's it, okay? So if you, if you allow people to enter full HTML, or if at any place in your theme, you output a node body field without filtering, or a node title field without filtering, or other kind of data that comes in from the request or is stored in the Drupal database, 
people can enter this or equivalent source code and can hack your user one password. And from there, they can do anything if they own the Drupal website. If they can enable uh, the PHP module from there, then they can run code on your web server however they want. Okay? Um, so how to protect from that? There's a lot of functions in Drupal that help with that, and this is the main family of functions that you can use in your theme, in your module, in your uh, custom PHP snippet, in your views header, PHP snippet, whatever. Um, so we assume HTML output here, and if you encounter a URL that's to be output, then we have the check URL function. If it's not a URL, uh, but, a, but plain text like a note title, or I don't know, a, um, an email address, then it should be run through check plain. If it has a format attached like a node body or any other place in Drupal where a format is attached to the text, then it's check markup and you should provide the format that should be used. And if there is no format attached, uh, which, I, which is at some places in Drupal like the site mission statement or site mission statement in Drupal 6 or the, um, I don't know, so quite a few places in Drupal core like, uh, like aggregator category descriptions, stuff like that, then you should use filter XSS, which still does some cross-site scripting filtering. Um, if it's none of these and you trust it, then you, then you can output to HTML. So we do these preparations to theme variables in the theming flow in preprocessed functions. So when you look at a tpl.php file in your Drupal instance that, that will have a huge list of variables that are already pre-sanitized for you to be used in your theme. So I would suggest you to use those first and foremost. And if you really need to have custom data in your themes, in your modules, then look at, look at these functions. We also support this um, with our localization infrastructure. So we have the TN format plural functions which automate calling off check plane and, um, and the placeholder theming functions. So you can use the translation function to compose a text uh, snippet that has these, this kind of filtering in there and it still reads like name has a blog at URL and the URL is filled in uh, proper and the name is filled in proper. <clears throat> Same is available in um, HTML, uh, in the JavaScript for uh, Drupal.tn, Drupal.format, plural. But not all output is HTML, so this, uh, as I've explained, was all the ways to filter text for HTML presentation but you will also do stuff like sending emails or building data for other uh, output formats. You should always consider the escaping for those places, like for sending HTML, depends on whether you send HTML email or plain text. If you send plain text email, Drupal has a function to strip all the uh, text from the HTML and format it uh, sensibly for sending it an email. So think about the kind of input you have, whether it's already sanitized, if it's not sanitized, think about the type of format that it has and then apply the sanitization uh, appropriate for the output format that we assumed to be HTML before but can be any other format as well. Uh, number three is authentication and sessions. Um, it, it's basically about weak password storage uh, and account management or session hijacking uh, or lack of session timeout. And Drupal already has pretty well, pretty well cooked solution for this, so you don't need to care a lot about this uh, problem. We do store passwords hashed and we are increasing our security with every release. So Drupal 7 increased on this from Drupal 6. Um, we do change session IDs when people are, uh, are logged in or logged out when permissions change. Actually, uh, in fact, when permissions are heightened. So whenever you, have, uh, whenever you get a new permission, we change your session ID so we can avoid you being trapped in a session hijacking problem. Uh, we do work on top of SSL and we do have some support for SSL that we'll see later. And we do have some nice modules for that which we'll also say later. Um, number four was insecure direct object references. And that's again very simple for Drupal actually. It uh, looks like a similar code example I've had for injection. 
But in this case, what happens is that I'm putting in a number and I'm just getting data for that kind of value. And I'm not checking whether the user has permission to have access to that value. And there's a lot of thinking to go in there uh, when you're building a Drupal site. So our menu system, that's our main system for dispatching requests in the Drupal system, is built, for, uh, is built with um, checking for permissions. It's kind of nice if you do want to check for permissions yourself. I would suggest the user access function if you do want to check a node permission, there's specific functions for that. And if you're writing queries directly against tables, which I suggest against, uh, but if you still want to do it, then you can add the um, node access tag to it. Now, one of the, one of the very interesting things here, and, and one that many people miss, is that when you create a view, uh, it does not filter for published nodes automatically out of the box. So one of the things that many people miss is then they create a view, they put out their content, and it will list unpublished nodes at first. And then you need to go in and check to not uh, list the unpublished nodes. That's kind of a um, insecure object reference. We, we uh, list all those contents and some of them is uh, not available for you, although you can see it. Uh, one of the m more interesting problems is cross-site request forgery. That's called cross-site, but it can actually happen uh, on your site. So one of the things that you can do with a Drupal um, user uh, is log them out. So if you can post an image or something that can make a request on behalf of the user on a website, you can log that user out. So if you post this code on, on a Drupal site that, that allows for images and anybody with this, visits this page, they will be logged out, okay? This is not very interesting because you know, you're not gonna gain anything by logging them out. But this is the type of problem that, uh, that cross-site request forgery is about, is that we are forging a request on behalf of the visiting user uh, with, for example, an image. There's other ways, other tags in HTML that allows this, like the script uh, style tag, other tags. So the real problem here is that this can be an action that's destructive for the site, like deleting something. So if, delete, uh, if we, if we uh, refer to deleting something, and it actually runs without questioning you, are you sure? Then it's going to be a problem for cross-site request forgery. So if you are fed up with Drupal always asking you about, are you sure you want to delete this? Then it's because of this problem. If Drupal wouldn't ask you, then anybody would be able to delete stuff on your behalf, okay? Um, there was a big problem with this when Google released their, uh, I think, browser speed plugin for Firefox back in the day, way before they released Chrome. How many, any of you remember the, the Firefox speed plugin? Yeah? So the problem there was that, that Google preloaded pages for you, like you visited a page and all the links it preloaded for you, so when you click it, it's gonna be available right away. Now if you're on a note page, like the note admin page, delete, 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 delete. Whoops, that would be a problem. So, uh, so this is, a, this is a problem for anything that does not check or does not ask whether, it, whether you actually want it to do it and just does right away. Some modules do this, so there's some uh, quick voting modules in Drupal where you just click something and it happens, and those might be vulnerable to uh, hacking this way. Uh, and then you need to decide whether you want to have a, a quick voting system or a less gameable voting system. Um, so the Drupal approach to solve this is that we, we uh, work with uh, uh, post submissions by default, which makes it harder to do this kind of uh, work. Uh, we include tokens in the form, so people need to download the form first that includes a token, and when, when you submit the form, you need to submit the token with it as well. And uh, we check validity for that. And we do provide APIs for those who want to have one-click links that have tokens so that it is somewhat harder to break. But if you have a cross-site um, scripting problem, then none of these will help you, none. Uh, number seven is insecure cryptographic storage, which can happen with your custom data, but Drupal does do a good job of uh, handling this for all the data that it handles itself. So as I've said before, we use uh, one-way hashes to store passwords, so they cannot be uh, cracked as easily uh, backwards. 
We do provide a randomly generated private key on every website that is secret in your uh, variables table to use for custom encryption. And we do have a, uh, quite a few models for you to encrypt data. And um, <clears throat> I, I don't have a, uh, a concrete suggestion on there what modules to use. There's multiples depending on your needs. Uh, but a lot of people are making backups at places. I've seen people sending backups by email to themselves. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and if you don't ensure that those backups are safe, those backups cannot be copied, then whatever we do on, on your database, it's not going to help. So, so be sure to look at your backups and who can access those backups because that can easily be a problem as well. This is the environment around Drupal that we don't often think about, but is very important. Uh, number eight is failure to restrict your access. We sort of touched on this before. Uh, our menu system uh, handles that. Uh, it's your responsibility to configure the permissions on your Drupal website to be proper. And the security team has a guide on this that I will link to later. Uh, and it's your responsibility to configure your views proper to um, not list unpublished data. Uh, number nine is insufficient transport protection. And at this point, I would like to ask uh, uh, who heard of Fire Sheep? Some of you, okay. So Fire Sheep is a very nice tool. So any of you who have your laptop open can go and download Fire Sheep. It's a free Firefox sidebar plugin that you can download to your machine. And what it does is that you turn it on and it collects or it looks at data happening in this open network. So anything that's happening on an open network, or no, no actually we don't have, don't have an open network here, right? So if you walk into a bar that has an open network and you just flip up your laptop with Fire Sheep on it, you can look at the data that's flowing on the open network. And what Fire Sheep does is it makes very simple for you to uh, capture meaningful parts of that data. So it looks at that data and it searches for website login information, for example. So it can find the uh, Facebook credentials for, for the uh, person that's sitting next to you or, or at the other end of the bar. And it will actually, it will, it will even show the Facebook profile picture of the guy. So you click on that and it opens a browser for you that is logged in to that guy's Facebook profile, okay? And you can do whatever in the name of that guy. And the reason for that is, uh, and, and, the, and the reason for that is twofold. One is that the network is open. Uh, that is a, a very good sign is that they are not asking for a password. And the second reason is if that Facebook profile was accessed on an HTTP connection, it's not encrypted. So if the network is open and the, and the data itself is not encrypted, then you can actually break into that uh, connection and then grab the user session ID, and from there you can do whatever in the name of that user. Uh, that's pretty powerful. So um, when you go to a bar, you should ensure that it either has good um, protection for the wireless that you're running with, or you have like a VPN to connect to before you do anything. Um, and on your Drupal site, what you can do is that you can try and run your Drupal site on full SSL, which is expensive, uh, but it's, it's being introduced in most of these high profile websites for this reason, because uh, breaking into these accounts is, is simpler by the day. Um, or what you can do is to try and secure some of your web pages, like what we do on, on DrupalGardens.com is that we're running with a set of these models um, to secure the login process itself and then secure whatever action you want to do on your account so that those actions are uh, protected from the outside. So secure pages is for uh, setting some of your web pages to be forced to run only on SSL. So like your user login or user edit pages would only run on SSL. And secure pages prevent hijack is about uh, trying, to hi trying to prevent hijacking that session cookie that you get when you log in, which becomes unsecure when you visit the other pages on the site. And this sets a secure cookie additionally to the insecure cookie and ensures that you can only browse the site if you have both. 
Um, there's a very good example of setting up these modules in a good uh, um, constellation on the DrupalScout.com website, and I would suggest you it's very easily findable with the, uh, no, when you navigate to the knowledge base, so you don't need to write all that down, and, and these videos will be available, and my session slides will be available, so that should be good. It's also important to not just secure your website, but also use a valid certificate. If people are used to your website downloading and spitting out an error message that the certificate is invalid, then uh, if somebody uh, performs a middle, a man in the middle attack and replaces your certificate and presents a different website uh, in, your, in your website's place, then they will not notice if your site is always popping up an error message of an invalid or expired or self-signed or whatever certificate, okay? So make sure that you have a valid certificate on any website that you value. Um, and finally, number 10 is kind of interesting. The last time I've had this session, Drupal still had vulnerabilities in this area. Uh, and I was kind of trying to uh, go it low. Um, the um, invalidated redirects problem is that you have a link that looks like it goes to example.com, but it actually redirects to evil.com. And I can put anything at the end of the URL and it will redirect there. So Drupal used to have this problem, I think, a year ago or so. Um, and the approach that it now has is, um, is that it, it uh, tries to use local paths, so none of, the external U, none of the redirections build external URLs to redirect to. And it also has uh, validation in Drupal Go to that, um, that looks at your, um, looks at your uh, redirection and whether that's an internal URL or not. But all your custom code or your themes that do like workflow simplification on your site can be vulnerable to this problem. So look at what kind of input you allow there and filter for, um, for relative URLs, if at all possible. So this was the uh, OWASP top 10 list as it applies to Drupal. I hope um, it was helpful. And I'd like to touch on one more subject here, um, which is a very common question. Uh, whether is open source secure. Of course, I'm saying it's secure. I'm from the security team. I'm working with the security team for four years. So, of course, I wouldn't say uh, Drupal is insecure uh, because open source makes people look at it. Open source makes people um, reuse the same code all over again, and they find mistakes, and they send it in. And even if they post blog posts about it, and it, come, and it goes out to the wild, we'll, uh, we'll be able to figure it out and fix it and release it. So a lot of, lot of ice uh, we have on that. Um, and also there's always more smart people to look at stuff. Um, I'm not at all good at all the 10 areas I've listed, no. I, I have expertise in a few and I know what to look for. But when, uh, when I have a problem, I, I have guides to look at, I have people to talk to, I have, I have the security team to report errors and they help uh, with fixing them. Of course, open source is insecure because uh, people can find holes in there, and people did uh, uh, did go into publishing uh, blog posts about the holes before we could fix them. That happens. Um, that's kind of the um, the um, the trade-off that we have here. Um, and all, and also the fix becomes public, and it becomes available, and then people can look at how how sites that are outdated can be attacked. And the, the Drupal security books, uh, chapter eight, talks about some of those problems that, oh, we've had these previous security problems and how you can find those sites and how you can break into them. So, uh, so this is uh, somewhat of a problem. It, it's, not, um, it's not really your issue if you follow the security releases and you patch your sites and if you uh, keep yourself well educated on these security problems. Um, so in concrete, uh, is Drupal secure or is it not secure? Of course, we try to design Drupal to be secure. I've had a lot of examples here on how we have APIs to filter text, how we have APIs to validate uh, form submissions, how we have APIs to validate tokens for encrypting data, for doing a lot of cool stuff. So, so we build these tools to be secure, but it's always on you to use it in a proper way. So if you give out full HTML or if you give out administer users, or if you leave a sticky note on your monitor with your password, then we can't help you out. Uh, there is a guide to writing secure code that I suggest everybody read who ever touches code, even, um, even if you think it's just a theme template file. It's the same PHP environment that the theme template files run in, 
than the rest of Drupal, so please look at that. <clears throat> uh, and be mindful of, of all, the, all the ways that you can make your Drupal site secure. What we do for you to, be, um, to feel secure and to uh, be secure is that we built a security team that is entirely built out of volunteers um, that, who ensure to, to put out security releases and who try to educate people around here to uh, be better at security. So our three goals is to, des is to help design Drupal to be secure by default to help educate people like you. So that's part of why I'm here. And the third goal is to fix problems. That's the third one, that's the last one. So we try to design Drupal to be secure and try to help design Drupal to be secure. We try to educate you to use it that way. And if there's a problem, we help fix it. Uh, our duty is that we look at Drupal core and all contributed modules on Drupal.org, which uh, means that we look at stable releases of modules. So if you're using a development release or an alpha release, you might be out of luck. So be sure to uh, look at the, um, the stability level of modules. We consider um, stable releases to be uh, supported. Uh, we do not actively look for vulnerabilities in, in contributed modules. We, uh, we are uh, middlemen between the reports coming in and helping the maintainers put out releases. So we, we look at, we assess the vulnerability that's coming in, we contact the maintainer and we work with the reporter and the maintainer uh, to put out the release uh, for, um, for the module or the theme in question. We only support the current and the um, one earlier version, so currently that's 7.x and 6.x. We do not support 5.x. And when 8.x is released, we're gonna stop supporting 6.x. We do have a few points of contact. We do, rele we do announce releases at drupal.org slash security. We have a separate feed for core releases. We have a separate feed for contributed releases. We uh, do have a guide on how you can uh, report issues uh, on security.drupal.org. We do have a guide on how can you report cracked sites. Uh, but it's very helpful if you can provide data to us on how we can reproduce the problem so we can actually fix it. And there's a, there's a discussion group on groups at Drupal.org called Best Practices in Drupal Security uh, that should be helpful if you have uh, more detailed questions. And finally, let me once again suggest the uh, Cracking Drupal book. It's very good, especially chapter eight. So if you haven't yet gotten around to reading this book, you should. Um, any questions unless I'm out of time? Yes. So the question was if I know any issues with Drupal configuration like outputting errors on the screen. Yes, outputting errors on the screen might help attackers to get information on what kind of environment your site is running at, like the, the, the operating system, the place your code is running, or the SQL error message uh, provides information on the query that the data is going into. So outputting error messages publicly on the web page is not only scary for visitors to look at big red messages, but also um, information disclosure. You provide the information for the attacker to guide them on how, they, how can they crack your website. So I would consider that a dangerous uh, thing. This is very good, very good on the development site, but I wouldn't suggest to do it on the life site. But do you know anything else than that? Do I know anything else than that? Um, I don't know, it sounds like a too general question for me. <laughs> yes. Do you see anything for DDoS attacks and protection from it? DDoS attacks. Um, so the question was, can I speak uh, anything to uh, denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks and any protection to that? Um, it's pretty hard to it's pretty hard to. Uh, to protect for that, I must say. Of course, your best protection is if you have a, a very well-distributed system to run your website on, and you can scale automatically up to any kind of uh, traffic, but it can be very expensive. Um, 
Drupal does have a very simple flood system that tries to protect people from flooding like contact forms and that kind of stuff. I would say that's not adequate for any sizable attack. Um, so I would suggest you look at the uh, web hosting layer and look for uh, denial of service attacks there. I can connect you with uh, Barry Gispen, uh, my colleague who's working on uh, solutions for that at Acquia. Uh, I think he, he would have much more concrete information for you. Yes. Yes, so the, the suggestion was to uh, have your own inner security team in you uh, to, uh, to look at the modules and the available code uh, with a critical eye. So we do say we support all contributed modules on Drupal.org, but we do not make any guarantees that uh, any of the modules would have a, uh, um, a backdoor or a security problem or a cross-site scripting issue or whatever. Any of the modules could have. Uh, we cannot guarantee that. So you should look at the activity of the model. If it's being worked on by a lot of people, if it's being used by a lot of sites, if it has an active comment uh, history, if it did have security releases before, that's a good indication that it's a good module. If it had a lot of security releases before, that's probably an indication it's a bad module. But if it had a few, it had eyes on it to, to look at it and fix problems. And the security team often looks at modules and finds other problems and then tries to fix multiples together. Not always, but tries to, um, tries to do a, a best practice around that. So there's a lot of these things that can inform you on Drupal.org and help you in your module selection when you uh, try to look for secure tools. Yes? The question was if, uh, if the Blowfish bug affected Drupal in any way security-wise, and I don't know the answer, unfortunately, sorry. Yes? So the question was, is it a problem that all of Drupal is in the document root under your web server? And is it, is it uh, something that Drupal warns you about when you like, upload something with FTP or, like, or SFTP, whatever, you upload a new module to your site and you change permissions on that or something? Uh, I, don't, I don't think Drupal will warn you on changing the permission on the doc root or on the modules folder. It will look at things like the settings file the files directory and those things. And it is, a, it is something you should consider that Drupal runs in the doc root altogether. People can upload stuff there and Drupal tries its best to protect uploads and rename uploads to have different extensions so the web server will not run them. And there is a, there is a, um, a big issue for Drupal 8 to move most of the core stuff into its own directory, so all the stuff that is modified by Drupal, like the files and profiles and those things, and custom modules are in a separate place from the rest of Drupal core, so you can keep the rest of Drupal core untouched and you know where to look for things that are modified. Um, and of course, there's uh, the Drupal 7 feature to separate the private files from the public files so that you can keep your public files in the document root and keep your private files outside the document root if you want to, and those are not gonna be accessible from, from the web server, even if your server is not reading your HTXS file that is there. So there's a lot of considerations around that. Uh, it, I would say it's ongoing, 
to secure that, and we probably got to improve on, on that in Drupal 8. I've seen the issue that's separating the user modifiable and the core distribution parts of Drupal to different directories. It's set to be com uh, going to be committed somewhere later this year, but it's breaking so many patches because it moves around everything that it's delayed for the fix-ups in Drupal 7 to, to get in, and then we can like make even more bigger changes in Drupal 8. Any other questions? No, then thank you. Thanks for being here.